it just really okay good i think my computer is getting old sorry guys it keeps overheating so i'm gonna have to turn off the camera again sorry about that all right okay so um so let's see so um so we have this uh so we had berger's theorem right about holonomy groups and um and so Barbara asked me about this uh, case five, right? Case number five at the bottom of the page, you know, how, what is this group, you know, SPR times SP1. All right, so let me just explain that a little bit better here. Um, right. Okay, yeah, here we go. So let me, I think I need a new page. So let me go and explain this in a new page. So what is the, um, so this is general, just an aside. Um, so, um, right, so SP, so what did we have? So we have that SPR, we said it's contained in the automorphisms of H to the R, right? So that, that as we said, these are basically the the, the uh, R by R matrices with uh, with uh, entries in the quaternions who commute with a given you know Hermitian quaternion Hermitian matrix. And what is so then? What is SP one? SP one we said can be also identified with SU two and also S three. This naturally lives inside H itself, right? So this is the group of unit length. unit length quaternions. All right. And so then this guy, so with the way the way that it works is that SP1 um, acts on, on H to the R via scalar matrix multiplication. So we so so that's so that's then so then when we write SPR times SP1, this is this is really the subgroup. This is the group generated. So the subgroup of the automorphism groups, right? Of HR generated by these two actions. So generated by the actions. Of SPR on the what on the on the one hand, and then the units on the other hand. All right. So so they do not. I mean, these two SP one and SPR do not commute, right? But you just take the subgroup that the, that their actions generate inside the automorphism group. And I guess the notation is 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 not very good, but um, it's the usual notation that people I use. I know, but so, now it's much more clear. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah, so it's not, you know, like I said, they don't commute, but they don't, they both, they both act, and then you take the subgroup that the actions generate. All right. And yeah, this is standard notation. So, you know, I didn't feel like I could change the notation. It's not very good, but okay. So um, let's see. So now let's go back to where we were. Uh, we were talking, um, so I wanted to give you guys examples of hyperkähler manifolds, right? And we started with um, with the case of dimension two. That's the smallest case, right? Because the dimension of a hyperkähler manifold has got to be at least it has it has got to have at least four real dimensions always, right? Um, so um, the smallest ones are uh, two dimensional ones. And for surfaces, uh, as I as we said before, SP one is equal to SU two, and SP one is the hyperkähler case, but SU two is the Calabi-Yau case. So what you get for surfaces is that being Calabia or being hyperkähler is the same thing. Um, and uh, 
the, the only surfaces that you get are K3 surfaces and complex tori. And I gave you the definition of a K3 surface. Uh, a K3 surface is, uh, we kind of, we're kind of, kind of going here with a minimalistic definition that this is the minimum that you need to define a K3 surface. Some people define a K3 surface as being simply connected, but I didn't do that there. I just said H1 of X OX is zero. And it's a compact complex surface with trivial canonical bundle. So omega 2x is isomorphic to ox, and h1 of x ox is 0. And then everything else you can deduce from this. You can prove that h1 of x ox equal to 0 actually implies that it's simply connected. You can also prove that the integral cohomology of the k3 surface is torsion free. And you can also prove that they're all scalar, in fact. We didn't assume that, that, it, that this thing is scalar, but you can prove that it is scalar. That is a hard theorem. And uh, they, have, they have unique Kähler metrics. Um, and uh, for complex tori, well, complex tori, I think uh, you guys know what they are because of, at least because of Angela's lectures. So uh, it's, uh, you know, C2 modulo a lattice. And um, so they are, they are not simply connected, obviously, but um, they are hyperkähler, right? They have a hyperkähler structure and the omega two is also trivial, okay. And then I gave, I gave um, on the next page, we had um, uh, the simplest examples of K3 surfaces at the top of the page here. So you can take double covers of P2 branch along smooth sextics. These are actually algebraic K3 surfaces, right? So uh, non-algebraic K3 surfaces could be um, projective varieties or not. They could be just compact k manifolds without having any kind of embedding into a projective space. So, um, but, but there are a lot of them that are algebraic. You know, you, you get uh, co-dimension one families uh, of algebraic K3s. And these examples that I've got here are all algebraic ones. Double covers of P2 branch along smooth sextics, smooth cortex in P3, two, three complete intersections in P4, two, two, two complete intersections in P5. Right. And then the others, as I said, are a little bit more complicated. So um, you can, you know, you can describe more complicated ones, but I, I'm not going to get into that here. All right. So, um, and then there are other examples. Of, so what about higher dimensions? So higher dimensional. Uh, Hyperkehlers, compact hyperkehlers. Okay, so what are, uh, what are these higher dimensional ones? Um, uh, actually, sorry, let me, uh, my computer is still overheating. Let me try to do something about that. I'll do that. Okay. it a little bit to allow it to cool down a bit easier. Okay, all right, so, so okay, so uh, what about higher dimensional compact hyperkähler manifolds? So, I mean, the, the, let me also explain why I'm so, um, I'm insisting so much on these examples. Uh, the thing is that it's actually hard to, um, write down examples of compact hyperkehlers. Well, people know a lot of examples of non-compact hyperkehlers, but uh, with compact ones, it's much, much harder. So the examples that I'm going to, I, I can basically, today, basically, I can sort of tell you all of the examples of hyperkehler manifolds that people know about. And it's a big open problem, actually, to try and write down new examples, or maybe to show that there aren't any other examples. Maybe this is all there is, maybe, or maybe, maybe it isn't, I, you, nobody knows, right? Uh, I'm not sure anybody is even conjecturing anything about it at this point. Um, the people don't feel that they have enough information for, for to even make a conjecture. Okay, so um, so let me. So then, what are, what are the examples that we already know? Uh, in 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 dimension two, we know all of them, right? But in higher dimensions, uh, we basically can construct them using the two dimensional cases. So. 
there are two infinite series of examples uh, which, which just use um, the surface case to produce higher dimensional compact hypercalyps. So, and the first construction involves taking Hilbert schemes of points. So that's number one. Actually, maybe I won't number it. Okay, so how does that work? <clears throat> we start with a compact complex manifold of dimension two, meaning a compact complex surface. And we, I will denote S to the R, the Rth Cartesian power. And let me denote S to the R in parentheses, the Rth symmetric power. Um, actually, let me just define it first. So uh, this is going to be S to the R modulo the action of the symmetric group. SR. So uh, this is the R uh, symmetric power. S. Um, and the action of the symmetric group is, is by permuting the factors of S to the R, right? So this um, so you can naturally think of uh, think of this the symmetric power as um, mm, effective zero cycles on your surface. So S to the R, you can we can also think of it as effective zero cycles, right? So a priori, you know, a point of S to the R of the Cartesian power will be, you'll have coordinates, right? X1, XR, XI and S. And if I'm looking at um, P bar, which is, so let me denote pi, the quotient map from S to the R onto the, onto the symmetric power. If P, P bar is pi of P, you can write P bar as X1 plus dot 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 plus x to the r. Now you see that if, if some of the xi's coincide, for instance, right, then you will get multiplicities inside p bar. All right. Okay, and I'm going to also introduce some more, some more notation that we call delta ij, the diagonal of the Cartesian power where the i and the jth coordinates are equal, right? Um, and we know that the action of the symmetric group is not free on the diagonals, right? And um, okay, and the, we can also describe the stabilizer, right? So the stabilizer of a generic point of delta ij, it's just a transposition. Well, of course you get the identity. I can take, I'm, I'm describing the subgroup, right? So I get the identity and then I have the transposition that in that permutes I and J. Okay, so um, all right. And this, um, this quotient morphism, right? So this pi is et al away from the diagonals. from the union of all the diagonals. Um, so, now basically, so now this already tells you 
that uh, the symmetric power cannot be smooth, right? So because the diagonals are co-dimension two, right? So the co-dimension of delta ij in in uh, in SR is two, right? So so then this map, you know, this map pi pi is ramified along ramified exactly along these diagonals. So then this means that S SR cannot be smooth because, because whenever you have a finite map of, um, of manifolds, the, there, we have the purity theorem, which tells us that the ramification locus has to, I mean, has to be co-dimension one. So if it's not, if the ramification locus is not co-dimension one, that means that we don't have manifolds. Now we know that S to the R is a manifold because S is smooth, so the Cartesian power is smooth. But then this tells you that the symmetric power is not smooth, all right? Okay, so this symmetric power is not smooth and what we're gonna do, we're going to resolve it. So this uh, SR has a natural singularization. And this is the Hilbert scheme. So this is the Hilbert scheme. Which I will denote S between square brackets of length R Artinian subschemes. Uh, Artinian, you know, analytic, of course, subschemes. We're in the analytic setting here, right? Of S. All right, and you have a you have a natural map from this Hilbert scheme to the symmetric power, which sends a subscheme Z to the underlying cycle. Which is going to be a zero cycle of degree degree little r, right? Because the length of the subscheme is r, so then the degree of the zero cycle will also be r. Um, okay, and um, so then this uh, this Hilbert scheme is is you know is a little bit complicated in general, but uh, it has a nice description in in codimension one. Or maybe I should say it's co-dimension two over the symmetric power, but it's co-dimension one on the on the Hilbert scheme. So um, so basically, so let me uh, so if there's let me do a geometric description. So uh, let so let S star R and or um, respectively. So actually, let me just um, introduce this in a different way. So I'm going to have S star R contained in SR, and then I'm going to have SR, the symmetric version inside SR, and I'm going to also have the Hilbert scheme version. And in all of these cases, so this one, the first one, uh, this is going to be uh, the open set where at most two coordinates are equal. Okay, and then the same thing. So the, the others will be the image. So this one will be, will be the image, right? Of that one. And then this, uh, this SR star, this will be the inverse image inside the Hilbert scheme. Okay. Um, so so what if you would have, what, what's going on here? So if you have, um, if you're given a cycle, Let's say where you know you have multiplicity two at one point, 
And so this one is as in, I want this one to be in SR lower star, right? If I have a cycle like this, how do I get a, an Artinian subscheme supported on this cycle, right? So the datum of an Artinian sub, subscheme of length R supported on this on, on this on this cycle is equivalent to the datum of a tangent direction. to S at X1, right? So if I want to specify a subscheme, while well, the subscheme is gonna be reduced everywhere except at X1, because the, the, the multiplicities are one elsewhere, right? So the only place where you have a multiplicity two is X1, and then to, the, to, this, to, to, you know, to, to specify the scheme structure, you just have to specify a tangent direction, right? So, so then there's the set of Um, Artinian subschemes. Uh, so, so what does this mean? So, the set of Artinian subschemes supported on two x one plus x r is can be identified with. the projectivization of the tangent space of S at X1, okay? So if I specify a tangent direction, that's the same as uh, specifying a point of the projectivization of the tangent space. Okay, so then, you know, so then from this, uh, you will see that, you know, so the theorem that I'm going to state now will, will make sense. I'm not going to prove the theorem, but it's not very hard to prove if you keep this, this statement in mind, right? So, the complex analytic pair <clears throat> SR. Actually, I need one more piece of notation. Sorry about that. So denote. Uh, so let's D, let D inside the symmetric power be the image of the diagonals. So this is just the diagonal, right? The symmetric power has but only, only one diagonal, right? And then the lower star is going to be D intersected with SR lower star. So the lower star is going to be exactly the, the places where two of the points coincide, right? All right, so let me call it, have that notation there. And then for my theorem, the complex analytic pair SR lower star, the lower star is locally and isomorphic to the pair, which I will call B times C and B times zero, where B is a complex ball. Uh, and C is a cone with vertex O over a smooth conic. In P two, okay. So this is this is a complete analytic uh, description of the uh, symmetric power, right? Well, away from the very bad points, right? These are at some bad points. Um, and uh, the Hilbert scheme, you can describe the Hilbert scheme as a complex manifold. This is the blow up along the lower star of the symmetric power. So if I remove the points where more than two coordinates coincide, then I can describe the Hilbert scheme as, as just a blow up of the symmetric power, which is, which is very nice, right? 
And then um, next, you can also, then you also have a commutative diagram, right? Uh, actually a pullback diagram. We have the Cartesian diagram. Like this, so you can, um, so you have the Cartesian power mapping down to the symmetric power. And then here we are, uh, we put the Hilbert scheme, which we said is the blow up along the lower star of the symmetric power. And then here you can put the blow up along the diagonal, the union of the diagonals of SR lower star. Maybe I should also call that the delta lower star because I am removing all the points where more than two coordinates coincide, okay? So, um, so basically, what are you saying here? You're saying, so this guy here was a quotient by the action of the symmetric group, right? So what, they're, what we're saying here is that the Hilbert scheme, it's the blow up of the symmetric power, but it's also the quotient of the blow up of the Cartesian power by the action of the symmetric group. So we're also saying that the action of the symmetric group actually lifts to the blow up, right? So the action of SR lifts to the delta lower star of SR upper star, SR lower star, okay? So you have a very nice picture, right? Um, and then, you know, once you have, uh, once you have this picture like this, then you can, uh, you can, in fact, you know, we want to show, what do we want to show? We want, what, in the end, what we want to do, we want to produce examples of hyperkähler manifolds, or if you like examples of holomorphic symplectic manifolds, which we saw are the same thing, right? So uh, here we're going to produce an example using the holomorphic symplectic language rather than the hyperkähler language. So if we assume that S has got a symplectic form, right, meaning, meaning an everywhere non-degenerate holomorphic two-form, then we can use this description, this diagram, to produce a holomorphic form, a symplectic form on the Hilbert scheme. Okay, so here's how we're going to do that. So, um, proposition if ks which is omega 2s is trivial then uh, sr the hilbert scheme admits a holomorphic symplectic form. All right. And let me give you a sketch of proof, idea of proof. All right, so how do we, how do, we do it? So, uh, so we're going to choose, um, a generator P of, um, or actually, let, no, let me call it omega. I'm used to calling it omega. I shouldn't change my notation. Omega of H zero of S A S, right? Now this, this is um, holomorphic symplectic because K S is trivial. So this guy, doesn't vanish anywhere, right? So um, our form doesn't vanish anywhere. It's a holomorphic symplectic form. Then we're going to pull it back. So C is, let's pull back via the first projection, 
we're going to pull it back to the Cartesian power first. Okay, so I'm, I'm pulling back via the first projection to the Cartesian power and then doing it for all the other projections, PR, R, upper star of omega, right? Where PRI from SR to S is the ith projection, right? Um, okay, so then, so now this is now a holomorphic two form on the Cartesian power, right? And um, and we we're going to pull it back. So if I if I go back to my uh, diagram here, let me give some names to these morphisms. So let me call eta this uh, blow up morphism here. Epsilon is this other blow up morphism. My quotient map was pi. And then let me call the other quotient map from the blow up of the Cartesian power to the blow up of the symmetric power. Let me call that rho. Okay. So. I took my form on S, I, I, I took an average, right? I, I pulled it back by the various projections to the Cartesian power, and then I took an average, right? Now I'm gonna pull it back to the blow up. So, so pull back to BL delta of SR star, so what do we do? So we take eta upper star of C restricted to SR lower star, right? And uh, so this is, this is invariant under the action of SR, right? And so is C itself, right? So. They're both invariant, right? So this means that there exists a holomorphic form phi on S star lower, uh, S lower star little r such that eta upper star of C is equal to rho upper star of phi. Again, remember rho is the quotient by the action of the symmetric group. So we're saying that eta upper star of C is invariant under the action of the symmetric group. So then it's a pullback from the quotient by the action of the symmetric group, right? But this guy, a priori, this is only well-defined on the, um, on SR lower star, okay? Now, because uh, the co-dimension, so because uh, SR minus SR lower star has co-dimension two. Uh, then uh, this this phi is actually um, phi extends to all of the Hilbert scheme. Okay. All right. So you've got we've got our form. It's a it's a two form, right? It's holomorphic. Uh, now, the only question is whether it is non-degenerate, okay? So I'm not going to get too much into the details of why it's not non-degenerate. So need to show that this phi is not everywhere non-degenerate. Sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what are eta and the rho in the previous page? Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, uh, let me uh, show you that. Oh, there it is. Okay. So yeah, so um, it, it's the, the blow up diagram, right? So uh, eta was the quotient by the action. Oh, sorry, sorry, no, eta. Yeah, eta is the blow up map, right? For, on the Cartesian power. And rho is the quotient by the action of the symmetric group on the two blow ups. That's what it is. Ah, okay. So you, you use the same notation, okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I don't. I didn't want to change notation because um, it's uh, it, it gets kind of heavy, you know. If I if I just it, it would be too much notation. So I'm I'm abusing the notation a little bit, right? I mean, I'm kind of uh, so so here, you know, when I so here I really should write C again, restricted to SR lower star, right? And the phi again is not 
a priori fee is only well defined on SR lower star, but I'm just saying I'm, ex I'm going to extend it. I can, I can extend it to all of SR, and then I'm going to denote it with the same letter. So I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to use a different letter, you know, to 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 denote the extension, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Um, all right. And uh, so we've got okay. So we've got this holomorphic. Um, it is a holomorphic form. It is a holomorphic two form, right? And we need to show that it's everywhere non-degenerate. The idea for doing that is to show that. When we take the top exterior power, this wedge R of phi, we have to show that this guy does not vanish anywhere. Okay. And in order to show that it doesn't vanish anywhere, uh, you need to do a little bit of analysis. Uh, I'm not going to really get into that, but uh, just let me give you the idea. The idea is show that it's divisor. So it is, this is a section of a line bundle now, right? I mean, uh, wedge R of phi is a section of a line bundle. And to show that it doesn't vanish anywhere, so. Is a section of, of the canonical, right? Because it's holomorphic two form. So, um, We show that its divisor of zeros is just the zero, the divisor is zero. It doesn't vanish anywhere. That's exactly it, right? So, and this you can do. It's not. It's not that difficult. You just you go. You can you go back over the definition of phi, right? Phi was obtained. We took the holomorphic symplectic form on S. We pulled it back via the various projections, and then we, uh, you know, we uh, we we took the average, and then we said that this that. The pullback of phi was discussed. So if you look at the definition, you can sort of work out what the divisor should be, and uh, you can show that the divide that, that there's no divisor. Anyway, okay. So I mean, if I have time, I can go back and and, and do a little bit more details on this maybe today or something. But uh, for now, let me uh, let me go on with uh, the other stuff we need to do. So um, okay, so we have our holomorphic symplectic form. But um, but it's not. I mean, of course, S R itself. You know, the Cartesian power itself has got lots of holomorphic forms. You know, you just take your holomorphic form on S. You can put it back via the various projections. You can take combinations of those. That's why we got our C. We took one such combination, right? But um, what's interesting about the Hilbert scheme is actually that it's going to be irreducible holomorphic symplectic, right? So in fact. This guy is irreducible. Holomorphic symplectic. And remember what that means. It means that there is up to a, up to a constant multiple, there is only one uh, holomorphic two form on this manifold. So, um, so that's, um, Okay, so that's, and uh, you can do that actually by basically showing, um, by basically com computing, you can compute the cohomology and the fundamental group of the Hilbert scheme, okay? Um, so let me just uh, maybe explain a little bit uh, how, that, how that works, right? Um, okay, so we compute, The fundamental group and and cohomology of SR. Oh, actually, it's irreducible if if S is K three. Okay, if S is if S is a a uh, complex torus of dimension two, it's actually not going to be irreducible. So we're going to have to do a little bit more work to get our holomorphic symplectic manifold. I mean, our irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifold. But 
Okay. So, but anyway, we can compute the fundamental group and the cohomology, right? Either way, just assuming that S is uh, holomorphic symplectic itself, right? Whether it's K3 or, or a complex torus. Um, so to do that, we're going to write, we're going to go back to our uh, blow up diagram again, right? So, um, and to our quotient by finite groups, right? This diagram here is, you know, the diagram that I had before, this Cartesian diagram is very important, right? This is how we're going to compute everything, basically, the cohomology, the, the fundamental group and everything. So um, the fact that we have quotients by, by the symmetric group, right, gives us, um, these are quotients by the symmetric group, so they're Galois covers, right? So you get exact sequences of fundamental groups, right? So, so we have that SR to SR and also the blow up map, BL delta of SR to the Hilbert scheme, actually it's lower star here, are Galois. And both of them have Galois group SR, the symmetric group, right? SR. So that means that we have exact sequences of fundamental groups as follows. Um, I can ever go one, SR goes to pi one of BL delta of uh, sorry, SR star goes to pi one of the Hilbert scheme. Lower star goes to zero. And then here I have a map. I can I can map this to pi one of the symmetric power. Here I can put pi one of the Cartesian power. And here I can also put SR again. Okay, all right. And now these two are of course equal. And if I look at these pi ones in the middle here, what have I got? Well, uh, the pi one of the blow up, uh, well, the, it's a pi one of the blow up along a co-dimension two space, right? So this is equal to pi one of SR lower star. And then again, because it's, we're just removing the co-dimension two space, this, this is also equal to that. Okay. All right. So you have, uh, you have a commutative diagram of exact sequences. You have isomorphisms in the, two, in, in the middle and on the left. So this means that, you know, if you do a little diagram chase, what you get is that pi one of the Hilbert scheme lower star is isomorphic to pi one SR. And then once again, you do some, you do the similar argument that we had before. This pi one here is also isomorphic to pi one of the Hilbert scheme. Again, because you're, you're always doing things up to a code dimension two locus, so you don't have any problems. And then also that, that means I can remove the star here. Okay. All right. So this is the pi one. And then, as I said, we can compute the cohomology. It's going to be a little lemma here. Uh, the cohomology of the symmetric power, I will do everything with rational coefficients, can be identified with the cohomology of the Cartesian power. And you have to take the invariance under SR. This is pretty standard, right? Whenever you take a quotient by a, by a national defined, finite group, you can do this. Number two, you can compute. Now, now we're going to compute the Hilbert scheme. Okay, this was, was just for the symmetric power. The comma the H two of the Hilbert scheme with rational coefficients is isomorphic to H two of the symmetric power direct sum multiples of the class of the exceptional divisor. So, I mean, again, this makes sense, right? Because, um, well, uh, we're talking about H2. So we can, again, because we're talking about H2, we can replace 
SR by SR lower star, right? Remove the remove the bad loci, and then it just it's just a blow up. So if it's just a blow up along the diagonal, then you get that you know this is just a blow up formula. The cohomology of upstairs is the cohomology downstairs plus multiples of the exceptional divisor. So this is also standard then, and then number three. Then we can also write down the cohomology of the symmetric power in terms of the cohomology of S. This is H2 of S, direct sum wedge 2 H1 of S. Again, this is this is uh, this is relatively standard. You just do um, uh, you use number one, which tells you that the cohomology of the symmetric power, you have to take the invariance of the cohomologies of the Cartesian power, and then you use the Kunis formula. So the Kunis formula will give you uh, the cohomology of the Cartesian power, and then you take invariance and you get you end up with this formula. So let me just briefly write down summaries of how we prove these things, right? So um, remember you should take at some point the five minutes break. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Yes, uh, yes, you're right. Actually, it's exactly time for the five minute break. Yeah. So, um, but maybe let me just write down the. the yeah, the, yeah, yeah. I was just. The first yeah. one. The first one, I guess I'm not telling you anything. I'm just telling you it's standard. Number two is the blow up formula. And replace S, uh, SR with. As our lower star. And number three, use one with the QNS formula. And, and the same thing, and replace SR with SR lower star. And that's it. That's all I needed to say. Thank you. So I will, okay, so we'll, we're stopping now for five minutes. Thank you. All right, thanks. Yeah, sorry for interrupting. I was just, I thought it was a good moment for a, a break, so. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. I mean, I, I, I was actually about to forget. <laughs> and actually I should say, I mean, I need, uh, I need to leave exactly at 11.30 today, if that's okay. So. Um, of course. I mean, yeah, okay, all right.